Good morning, guys. Once again, uh, very good morning to some of you all. It's very early in the morning in some parts of the world. Uh, thanks for joining in. I hope you all are doing well, healthy. Um, it's wonderful to connect again this week. Um, so let's get started. Can I request one of us to uh, please lead us uh, in prayer and we'll dive into the course? Anyone, please lead us in prayer. Thanks. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for the grace of life and the assurance of faith. We thank you for the meeting of the brethren this morning. We thank you for our pastor. Thank you for the supply of the spirit of truth that in his mind he conceived the righteousness that you want him to communicate to us this morning. I thank you for my brethren. We bring everyone under the covering of the love of Jesus this morning. And we say that class is going to be an oratory of the spirit of truth in our hearts, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks, Lord. Okay. All right. Um, so we'll start off with uh, chapter five, worship ministry uh, in the local church. And we'll start looking at the spiritual aspects. Right. Uh, we've covered quite extensively um, the organizational aspect uh, of, of a worship ministry, right? from the role of the senior pastor to understanding the role of a worship pastor, uh, the daily duties that go into it, the responsibilities that uh, go into leading a worship ministry, um, the importance of organizing uh, a worship ministry from the roster to planning the year out, uh, you know, with every event uh etc and from budgeting to rostering uh your worship teams and being in line and sync with the vision of the senior pastor of the church uh building a culture uh, all of that we've looked at quite extensively uh in the previous chapter right uh, worship ministry in, um the organizational aspect of it um so uh, from in this chapter we look at the spiritual aspects of a worship ministry most of the things that we've already discussed uh and some of them some of the points may might seem very repetitive or already discussed about um or very basic and foundational uh but I'm all about the basics. I'm all about the foundation. Uh, I something about the basics. I absolutely love. Even when teaching music, um, I emphasize you know the importance of the basics, the foundations, the fundamentals of it. Um, and if we can just understand that, I think we can build on whatever we want to on the foundations of it. Okay. So uh, the spiritual aspect of a worship team is. As you can see in your notes, it's quite very simple. Um, so what we expect of our worshipers, our worship team members, is we encourage them to be uh, worshipers on stage and off stage. Right, worshipers uh, on stage and off stage. Um, so in our church services, apart from the pastor or preacher, it is the worship team that has direct spiritual impact on the lives of people in the congregation okay can i say that again apart from the pastor or the preacher you know the, it is the worship team that has direct spiritual impact on the lives of people in the congregation right if you remember uh, earlier on in this course uh, i made a statement that says it's the worship team that sets the tone or the hunger level uh, for the entire congregation right and um, and so it's quite important. So hence the worship ministry is an important part of a spiritual ministry of a local church. Right. So a uh, couple of things that uh, as a worship team, we are worshipers both on and off stage uh, with the lifestyle of worship. Um, so remember, I said some of these things will be very basic um, and almost like, like it's common sense kind of a thing, isn't it? Uh, but. So bear with me. And um, we are worshippers both on stage and off stage. Why something as fundamental or basic as that has to be mentioned? Uh, what is the importance of uh, a statement like that to be made? Because uh, as a leader or as a ministry leader, it is possible for us to think, okay, hey, you know, hey, that's 
common sense. If you're if you're a worship pastor or a worship leader uh, on a Sunday and you're leading worship, uh, you know, it should go without saying that you should be a worshiper off stage as well, isn't it? Um, but in you know stressing on that, teaching on that, uh, you know, keep emphasizing on the importance of living a lifestyle of worship off stage is as crucial. Isn't so that we emphasize that uh, you know, we are we emphasize that we are not a ta talented group using uh, skills to perform, entertain, or please people. Uh, someone said, uh, "Hey, we are worship leaders, not cheerleaders." <laughs> okay, uh, we are not just a skillful music band or excellent church band that sings spiritual songs. We are not just a skillful music band or excellent church band that sings spiritual songs. We are worshippers first, right? That takes precedence over everything. We are worshippers. And everything that we do is worship. Uh, and our lifestyle is a lifestyle of worship, right? Uh, what we, what, the way we express our worship with our instruments uh, is, is important, it is worship, right? And so we encourage our people to be worshippers on stage and off stage. That... Uh, that that hat never goes off. You're always you know, that hat of a worshiper, so to speak. Uh, right, is always on. So, uh, three areas of responsibility that comes uh, in this category when you're talking about worshippers on stage and off stage. Just living a lifestyle of worship. Uh, the three things that come under this category. One is a personal life and testimony. Uh, commitment to the local church is the second one, and third, a personal accountability. Right. So the second and the third point uh, has been misplaced with the previous chapters. So uh, once we cover the point one, a personal life and testimony, uh, we will go back to the previous chapter. Uh, you know, I'll give you the page number and I'll, sorry, I'll recollect it and share the notes with you all um, in the stream section. OK, so the first thing, our personal life and um, testimony. A personal life and testimony um, and so guys it's a question for us it's a question for you all uh, why is this important why is your personal life and testimony important as a worshiper because we represent Christ because we represent Christ, because we are representing, right? Re representing Christ to people around us, to our society, to our community, to the world around us, isn't it? Okay. Thanks, Sri Kumar. Uh, what else? It's not a tricky question. According right? to Colossians 3 17, mm -hmm. not only singing, whatever we say and whatever we do, do it unto the Lord as a thanksgiving. As I, if you would like me, I can read that verse. Yes, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Now it is not a program, but it is a lifestyle of you know, every uh, testimony is very important. One second, sir. Sure, Papa. Yeah, thank you. Someone else can share. I'll just open the screen. Sure, sure. Yeah, no worries. Take your time. Okay. In the meanwhile, I'm just going through some comments. Uh, but whenever you're ready, you can go for it, Rupa. Yes, yes, I'm ready. One second, sir. 317, it says. Everything you do or say should be done to obey Jesus Christ, your Lord. And in all you do, give thanks to God the Father through Jesus. And in the same chapter, third chapter, 25 verse also, it says, but remember that anyone who does wrong will be, no, I think it is. It also says, uh, remember that you will receive your reward from the Lord, which he promised to his people. You are serving the Lord in whatever you do, do and say. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Rupa. Thank you. Uh, 
Yes, say, I see. Okay, Pastor, when we say worship team, I believe this includes the instrumentalists too. Yes, uh, say, yeah, musicians too. Yes. Um, it's not just the worship team, it's the entire team, right? Um, Asha says, because to testify our God and who he is in our life, yeah, we are priests and witness of Jesus. Yep. Yeah, okay, a personal walk with God. Um, and once again, uh, it can seem such a basic and a fundamental thing, isn't it? But it it is why do so many uh, Christian leaders um, are targeted or made fun of, to be very brutally honest, or to be mocked on some of them, not all of them, right? Uh, because of their personal life and their testimony, isn't it? It's it's a contradiction on stage and off stage, isn't it? And so uh, that's key right here is our personal walk with God along with skills he has given us is what qualifies as as a worship team member and so one of the key things that goes into that is a godly life right it begins with us being vessels of honor living a life of holiness right vessels of honor living a life of holiness and consecration before God and maintaining a godly testimony before men, right? But living a life of holiness and consecration, um, like uh, Sri Kumar has mentioned, uh, as priests, right? Priests in the Old Testament, they were set apart, right? Their only duty was to minister unto the Lord. And so we see in the New Covenant that we are royal priesthood, right? A holy nation. Um, so it begins with us as a vessels of honor, and uh, if you come down into point B, you see there's a small diagram or an image in page 57, uh, image of like a house kind of a thing. The, the, the foundation of it is being a vessel of honor, right? In the Old Testament, in the tabernacle of Moses uh, and in the temple that uh, Solomon built, all the vessel, right, from the plate to the every furniture, uh, and you know, even the uh, the thing that uh, the the priest would wear, the cup that they would drink from, everything would be in uh, will have this inscription, "Holy unto the Lord." Every vessel would be, have this inscription, "Holy unto the Lord." That means it is separated unto the Lord. Right, uh, the foundation, the the fundamental of it begins when we realize that we are vessel, and there is this inscription on us that we are purchased with the blood of Jesus, and with that comes this inscription that we are set apart, we are holy unto the Lord, and godly life begins at that journey. Right, uh, we are vessels of honor, uh, and we are called to live a holy lifestyle, and. And um, the holiness or living a lifestyle of holiness uh, is not a cosmetic thing. That something that we've learned, uh, you know, in the first years and also in this um, in this course is it's not a cosmetic thing. As in, what do I mean by that? If you if you wear a white shirt and a white pant, uh, you know, it's a certain community can say okay that you are holy. Uh, if you have a if you have a beard, you're not holy. <laughs> I don't know if you wear a certain thing, you know. Holiness is not a result of cosmetic. It's not something that is earned or, you know, it's holiness is a result of intimacy with God, with Jesus, right? It's the fruit, uh, holiness is a fruit of our intimacy, uh, intimate relationship with Jesus, isn't it? So that's uh, the first thing, right? A personal life and testimony. Uh, we are called to live a godly life. Uh, we are a vessel of honor. And second is we see a spiritual growth. Right? How how do we keep building on a personal life and testimony? Once that the foundation is set, then you start growing. Right? Three areas that are pillars in our life where we need to continuously grow. Right? Continuously grow. First thing is God's word. Rupa, uh, Rupa, I assume that you're still in the book of Colossians. Can you read Colossians chapter three, verse sixteen, please? One second. Yeah, sorry if I put you on the spot. No, no, not at all. Three, sixteen. 16. Yes. Okay, one second. Sir. 
Let the teaching of Christ live in you richly. Use all wisdom to teach and instruct each other by singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Thank you, Rupa. Thank right, there's a version that says, uh, let the word of Christ, right, rich in your dwelling. Uh, rich in, uh, dwell in you. <laughs> okay. Um, so God's word continuously growing in God's word. Uh, it's you know, it's not just taking a word or a verse uh, that you know. Say the Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want. It's like wow. Okay, it's amazing. Yes, it's amazing. It you know, and we don't stop there, and you you kind of go through it, right? Um, that's an example of us. Uh, where some of us are satisfied with just a verse or a, a, a chapter or a, or a book and then we say okay this is enough and not wanting to make an effort to you know just uh, go back to it read the scriptures more and more and more again right um, this is book I uh, I recommend I suggest it's uh, one is the APC publication called God's Word the other one is uh, um, a book by this person called Gordon Fee. Uh, I'll just type it out there. Uh, it's a book by Gordon Fee. It's called um, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. Um, I mentioned this because there's a difference between uh, reading the Word of God and studying the Word of God, right? So you you read it for you know for your soul for your spirit to be encouraged for you to be encouraged to be lifted up for you, to nourish yourself right so you read the word of God it speaks to you it's alive it's prophetic in nature right so you read the word for that and then you also set time to study the word of God like what most of you are doing in this course we what we do we kind of dissect things and we study the word of God isn't it. Uh, you know, we study, we take a letter, say, okay, what's the background? What's the cultural background? Say, for example, Ephesians, okay, who's writing it? When was it written? Uh, who's the audience that that's, it's being returned to? Uh, what's their cultural background, their history, and all of that? You can, so that is studying the word of God, isn't it? So uh, God's word is, is it's beautiful. It's, uh, it's alive. And so we, we are called to continuously grow in it isn't it and my favorite psalm on the emphasis of god's word is psalm 119 right psalm 119 once again forgive me if i've mentioned this before but it has about 175 76 verses uh sorry if i you know 175 or 76 verses uh, and every verse of that psalm uh, has the words uh, ways decrees statues promise command law word and all of these words simply point to god's word right uh, for example psalm 119 verse 105 uh, talks about uh, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path right um what what's other verse psalm 119 verse 18 open my eyes to the hidden things of your word open my eyes to the wonderful things of your word um, Psalm 119 verse 9, uh, it says, How can a young man live his ways, uh, his live his life pure by living according to the word of God? And like that, if you just go verse after verse after verse, every verse has these words, decrees, statutes, word, ways, laws, commands, promise. Uh, all of that is pointing towards God's word. And one of the historians says that Psalm 119 is a love letter to God's word. Um, it's amazing, isn't it? Someone would write uh, a love poetry to the Word of God. Um, and so uh, we need to be excited about God's Word. Uh, we need to be, um, it, it should do something to us as like, wow, this is God's Word. It, it, it needs to excite us, right? So growing in God's Word, uh, that's, in, that's crucial. And then you see in God's Spirit, we continuously grow in the Spirit of God, right? Ephesians chapter 5, it, it's encouraging us to be filled with the Spirit, right? Um, what's if, if, if someone can someone read Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, please? Shall I read first? Yes, please. Okay. Ephesians 5 18 says, and do not get drunk with wine 
for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Amen. Thanks, Agni. Right. So uh, most of the Christians, uh, when you read, uh, when, when we read that Ephesians five eighteen, uh, you know, we read it and say, okay, do not be drunk with wine. It's like, yes, absolutely, brother. You know, we. I'm a Christian. You know, I don't do that. It's a command that I follow very strictly. Uh, <laughs> uh, but what about the second half of that command? It's it's it's. Uh, I don't want to say all the time. It's sometimes or most time, most of the times, it's overlooked. We only look at the first half of the command, but the second half of the command is also is be filled with the spirit, right? Uh, don't be filled with this. That means you can't remain empty, right? You 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 throw this out, but you fill it with something of God, right? Um, so we are commanded to be filled with the spirit. Our cup has to overflow. Uh, and um, and then the third point there is our individual area of skill. God's word, God's spirit, uh, our individual area of skill, uh, and something about these things. I think, uh, you know, David was uh, sorry, I'm hearing something. Right, uh, you know, David was skillful in what he did, um, right, and there's so many others. You know, there's something about the people of those days, uh, especially the shepherd. Uh, shepherd men or women um I, when i was doing a study on psalm 23 uh it says the shepherds the jewish shepherds in the, of that terrain they were extremely good at uh what is that uh, slinging a stone they were extremely highly skilled at slinging a stone it's, there's a verse somewhere in the old testament i forget now uh, it says their aim was so perfect that they could split a hair. And that's how skilled uh, the shepherds were. And what they would do is, you know, if uh, if a, if their sheep, if their flock is going astray or whatnot, uh, you know, from wherever they are, the shepherd would kind of fling a stone uh, at a rock that is close to the sheep. And so it will tell them, it will hit that rock and it will tell them that they need to change the direction or not to go the other side. So they were skillful in what they did, isn't it? So uh, the point here again is to keep growing in skill, and uh, you never know where it's going to take you or who in front of whom it's going to make you stand. Like it was David's, you know, David's skill. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, but it's it's combined that with his skill made him stand in front of the kings, right? And it kind of started, you know, promoting um, his life. God's word, God's spirit, our individual area of skill, whatever it is, I you know you you recognize your skill as. And the third point is personal life of worship. I cannot lead people in worship if I am not a worshiper. Amen. <laughs> I need to be a worshiper in private if I am to lead worship uh, in public. I, I hear an amen. <laughs> I, I cannot lead people in worship if I am not a worshiper i need to be a worshiper in private if i am to lead worship in public right uh, david was able to kill a goliath in public because he was able to kill a lion and a bear in private when nobody could see right uh, once again just talking about the shepherd uh, when a shepherd uh, takes his flock and goes to grazing them Shepherd is all alone for eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours. He's gone for a long time and he's alone. He or she is alone with the flock. And you can imagine David just writing and pouring out some of the songs and psalms that he wrote when he is all alone and his audience were the sheep. Right. Uh, just in that in that private time, he's building that relationship uh, with God. Uh, he's writing all these songs, his poetry, this love songs to him. And then it's in private that he kills a lion uh, and a bear. You know, it's it's an amazing story, isn't it? When he's telling in First Samuel 17, I think, when Saul says, "Is like, how can you go and fight this Goliath?" Uh, and when David responds is beautiful. He says, "When a lion came and took one of my sheep, I went after the lion." and held it by its beard 
okay it's not me saying the bible says okay i think it's the new king james version or niv it says i held it by its beard now how close do you have to be to hold a lion's face by its beard what's mean you have to be pretty close to the lion isn't it <laughs> right very close very close like uncomfortably close to a lion like not most of us would want to be that close to a lion but he says that's how he went after it he held it by its beard and rescued its sheep uh you know and this power in some of the things that in in a private worship it's in a private secret place uh um, you know it's i'm like teaching it to the choir now because most of you already know the importance of um the, you know uh your, your secret life, your private life, uh, your devotions and whatnot. But things are being defeated when you worship God alone. Right? And 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 public worship is just an overflow of what you do in the private. It has to be an overflow of what has already happened in, in, in the private. Right? Uh, my friend, uh, Hari, his name is, and I'll never forget the statement that he made. He says, uh, he said, uh, with intimacy, God will use you. Without intimacy, you will be using God. I'll say that again. Right? With intimacy, God will use you. Without intimacy, you will be using God. What does it mean in our context is as a worship leader, right? as a worship leader, and I'm 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 developing this intimate relationship with God, right? Uh, I'm getting to know Him. He's pouring out His heart uh, to me, uh, His you know, uh, and and I built that intimate relationship. And on a Sunday, I am leading worship out of that intimacy, right? It's just an outpouring. It's uh, my cup is overflowing. But what happens? What about when I'm not building that intimate relationship with Him? So through the week, I have not read the word. I have not spent time praying. I have not spent time listening or seeking his word, nothing. But on a Sunday, just come start leading worship. I'm sharing this because it's happened in my life. As a worship leader, I have gone through a week or weeks without praying or reading God's word and lead worship. And there will be people who will come and say that, you know, uh, I had a blessed time of worship. Now, what has happened there is I led worship without intimacy. It's almost like, and, and I'm using God in a way, how? Because God will show up regardless of your intimate relationship with him in a public and a corporate setting. Why? Because God is good and he loves people. So he will show up to touch people regardless. But is that what I want as an individual? Right, which is nice and I leave that to you guys, right? Um, so I would always prefer the first one. With intimacy, God will use me. I would, it will, it's always better and uh, amazing and awesome when God uses me. I am the vessel, right? I'm, and I want to be the vessel that God uses, right? So uh, personal life of worship is, uh, yeah, it, it can't be uh, emphasized enough, right? So that's personal life of worship, growing in skill and worship. Worship team members must continuously grow and work on developing their skill as singers, musicians, and worship leaders. Um, it, it, again, if you are the worship pastor, um, have certain uh, expectations uh, or set certain goals uh, to your team, saying, okay, guys, in the first quarter of this year, I want us to see us grow in this. Let's take a simple thing. So if you have a team, of uh, musicians, uh, say, who do not know music theory, for example, right? Who don't know how to build a major scale. I'm going to sound a little technical. Please forgive me, but these are the musical terms, OK? <laughs> um, so if, if you have a team that is young, they are beginners, um, if they don't understand music theory, if, you, if they don't know how to build a scale, uh, what a major chord is, if they don't understand the difference between a minor chord or how to build all of those things, 
what are you going to do about it so you set a goal it's okay right in this quarter guys we're going to focus on learning our theory becoming good with it and the next quarter we aim at getting better and getting better okay so you uh, set some tangible uh, goals uh, that you can measure your team by okay and so that's how you gauge a growing in skill um, and so similarly uh, if you're not the worship pastor or the worship leader if you're the senior pastor uh, you know some of the things that you can ask your worship pastor to work on and you can ask him okay hey is does the worship team know about these things these technical aspects of it and whatnot right um, so that's the growing in skill and worship uh, E is growing in Christ likeness and serving with humility. Right? Worship team members must grow in Christ like character. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, uh, it starts off, the chapter starts off by saying, Be imitators of Christ. Right? Uh, that, that, that amazing chapter uh, that we, uh, it's such a popular chapter in the book of Ephesians. The whole chapter starts off by saying, be imitators of Christ. Uh, it depends on which translation you're reading. Uh, that's what it is, right? to be Christ-like in character. Um, it's the Francis of Assisi, uh, right? He said, preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. <laughs> preach the gospel at all times if necessary, use words. He's simply saying, let your life speak. Let your actions speak louder, right? Let your actions display and represent uh, Christ in our character, in our integrity, in who we are and how we serve, right? Uh, once again, this is a, a brilliant quote by Bill Johnson. He says, um, rule with the heart of a servant and serve with the heart of a king. Right, I'll say that again. Rule with the heart of a servant and serve with the heart of a king. Isn't that beautiful? And, and that's what uh, serving with humility is, that you serve with the heart of a king and you rule with the heart of a servant. Um, right, so when, we, when, when these basic core values are, are driven drilled into our worship team members you have a very healthy worship team uh, that is on the right track right that's on the right track so um my formative years were the years say between 2007 and 2009 where i was under a worship pastor uh some some of you might know it in some those in india sunny prasad uh, uh, who's actually the brother of one of the famously uh, famous musician Benny Prasad, who's traveled the world. And so he was my worship pastor. Um, every Saturday, Friday and Saturday, for like two and a half years, the time that I was under his leadership, for two and a half years, every Friday, Saturday, he would drill us with God's word. Like he would instill uh, the importance of God's word. That's all we did before we before we begin to practice a song for sunday we he would just make us sit as six of us and just drill us the importance of god's word week after week after week and those were what i would look back and see my formative years and uh, and instilling this core values this basic fundamental things into the individuals of our worship team will do wonders for your ministry and the growth of your ministry right so um those are the just five simple pointers uh for our personal life and testimony which is godly life um spiritual growth personal life of worship growing in skill and worship and growing in christ likeness and serving with humility okay uh everyone good so far uh, are you all okay learning something any thoughts or questions As worship leader, please share with us your daily personal time reading the word of the Lord and your prayer life. Um, so I am the morning person. My wife is not the morning person. Uh, mornings are my time. Um, it's uh, 
I'm just hearing this because Christopher is asking this question. So it has to start with coffee. I need to have my black coffee um, early morning. Uh, 5 a.m. is my start. And uh, and what I read, it, it basically depends on the season um, that I'm in or some uh, which where God leads me to be certain things, a certain book. I would spend that. Um, I will. I. I uh, leave the reading of a book uh, to the evenings, um, not morning. Morning times, uh, I prefer reading the Word of God. That's, I think that's kind of sets the tone for me. It works for me. Uh, later on during the evening, or what I've actually recently got into a habit is, uh, which I'm enjoying, which I didn't think I would enjoy, is uh, audio, uh, audio books. Uh, you know, get a headphones on, you know, and just. Um, um, just go for a walk in the evening when you jog in the evening <laughs> I put on the headphones uh, and uh, just play an audio book um, and I, I've i learned that it's, I remember things that I hear and so that's amazing so uh, that's my personal thing I start early morning around that time and read God's word um, yeah just uh, Praying in the tongue, praying in tongues, and uh, I'm meditating on God's word like through the day, yeah, and then listening to an audio book. Um, so that's yeah, that's what that's what it looks like, Christopher. So, yeah, no problem. Uh, anything else, guys? You want to add? Uh, you have questions about what we just discussed? Uh, any coffee lovers? <laughs> Okay, any tea lovers? <laughs> so, Pastor, uh, just I was just thinking as you were talking about the worship leader, yeah. any ministry you are engaged in, any ministry in any part of, uh, you know, you're serving in the church, I think these principles apply particularly yes. everywhere. Yes. The, and I am I'm serving in the children's church and it is as important you know, to touch these lives, which are naive, which are fresh, which are receiving. So yes. unless we come with that anointing, unless we are enriched with the word of God and prayer life, yes. and that's like preparing the soil, good soil for sowing the seeds. So our lives prepare that soil and God works. Yes. And we, he sees that we are putting in that discipline and effort. Yes. Then only, otherwise, you know, we can go on. Uh, I remember pastor, I think pastor only said like, Churches without Holy Spirit are running for years. Yes. So yes. It's, they can run. You can be deceived. You feel, okay, things are going. Of course, yes. there's an anointing that pastor carries and others yes. carry. You flow in that grace. Yes. But you need your hard work also in that. So that's what I'm experiencing, that it's not just being a worship leader, but in any yes. ministry that you are. Yes. It's smallest ushering also. Yes. There is grace that people would see on your face when you're leading them to the seats and helping yes. them find a seat you know they feel so comforted by your actions <laughs> absolutely yes absolutely yeah yeah uh, i think that's you know spot on it, it's applicable for every uh, you know ministry leader those uh, the volunteers it's crucial I mean, you read in acts chapter 6 right uh, it's the birth it's the beginning of the birth of uh, the deacons um, and the elders from that chapter on you see and they say that uh, even those who were serving food were filled with the spirit of god um, it's serving it's food. Um, um, yes, Rupa, go ahead. I just wanted to add a point, sir. You have telling us, but not only as a worship leader, we are we are all worshippers, and yes. God needs each of us that heart of worship, connecting to Him in mean, whatever we do, and uh, as a ministry, that is secondary. God yeah. wants our hearts to be connected to Him in a heart of worship. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Rupa. Yes, uh, thanks for sharing that, Adni, as well. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, just to, again to reiterate the very basic fundamental point is, see, as uh, you know, most of us, if not all of us, most of us would be engaged in a in an area of ministry, uh, if not right. 
And if you're leading a ministry, uh, whichever that is, like say a worship ministry, for example, or children's ministry or teaching, um, what's happening is you are giving, like you are giving week after week, day after day, you are pouring out, right? What happens when you keep pouring out is if you, the, the secret place, the secret time, your private time of worship and devotions, whatnot, is where you are refilling your inner man, your, right, your spirit. If that doesn't happen, you are in a very dangerous place on the path to what we call as burnout. Uh, right, you feel burnt out. You feel like absolutely exhausted in 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 the in, the, in your inner man, uh, and and that's when you begin to rely on yesterday's manna, on yesterday's anointing, on yesterday's uh, experience, uh, on yesterday's revelation. Uh, you know when when you know when when you don't have the private time. So it is in the private time of worship uh, is when there's new revelation, new manna, new anointing being poured out fresh every day. And so that's very important for us. So just, just reiterating the point with what we were discussing, um, right? And uh, how many of you were able to uh, download the publication Power of Commitment that I shared on the stream section? It can be, if you can go back very quickly to page 52 in your notes, in your PDFs, um, so this uh, it talks about um, the commitment to the local church, page 52 in your PDF. Uh, these points were supposed to be in the, in the chapter 5. And so it's kind of misplaced. Uh, apologies for that. Um, so very quickly, I uh, want to just run us through uh, the commitment to the local church, which is in line uh, to the second point uh, of the spiritual aspect is uh, what do you have to say about commitment, guys? What, what, why is it important? Anyone? Commitment. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word commitment? Sir, you are responsible. Okay, you are responsible. All right. What else? Being faithful. Being faithful, okay. Being regular, being whatever, maybe being regular. Okay, being regular, all right. Uh, what are the word? So, what are some of the characteristics of a committed person? Like, what are some of the yeah characteristics or the traits of a committed person? Accountable, okay. You're passionate or you like whatever you're committed to do. Okay. I'm just looking for the answer. It says, I am a committed person. Yes, I am the definition of commitment. <laughs> I'm just looking for someone to say that. <laughs> Dedicated and obliged to serve. Okay. Yeah. It, uh, you know, someone. For me, it's like when you are uh, true to their word, yeah, faithful, yeah, give total yourself into it, yeah, sacrifice, okay, yeah, uh, that means uh, they are willing to pay any price, isn't it? Uh, right? That's what sacrifice is honest and genuine, yeah, they're willing to pay any price, uh, willing to overcome all obstacles, uh, they are not shaken by. Uh, challenges obstacles that come uh, they're, yeah, they're willing to overcome they don't give up yeah like I was saying uh, they are focused so um, you know uh, yeah I think that's that's kind of a challenge in 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 this day and age uh, is I was just sharing this with a friend of mine last week is uh, you know in my time as a teenager and as in uh, youth is Weekend meant our time in church for us to give, you know, uh, time to the church, as in be the first ones to go on a Saturday, uh, set up everything, the chairs, the sound equipments and whatnot, and the last ones to leave 
um, the church as in after packing everything and whatnot. So that's that's what it looked like. And uh, it, it was not work. It was not exhausting. It was not uh, boring or it was not, it didn't seem like, oh, okay, now I have to go to the church because I gave my name for volunteering. And it didn't seem like that. Well, it seems like that in this day and age, it's like, oh, I have to go to the church because I've given this name. You know, I have to go get this thing done. Uh, there's a sense of lost <laughs> excitement. I, I'm, this might not be, I'm just generally saying, okay. Um, but there's something beautiful about commitment. Uh, and, and it is challenging. If it was not challenging, everybody would be a committed person. Right, uh, but then that's the beauty of it: is a committed person is willing to overcome uh, all of that. Right, and so when we look at our commitment to the local church, uh, uh, you know, committed to the local church means you're committed to your church family, to your church body. You're saying, okay, this is where I'm being nurtured. I'm choosing to be nurtured, to be cared, and also to care for the other members of the church, uh, and and to the church itself. That I'm in line with that vision the church uh, and I'm also you know caring for the other members and I'm, I want to give back to the church by say a volunteering in a certain uh, you know it's not when we when we talk about giving back to the church it's uh, it's it's not just finances right uh, yeah it's it's one of it's one of the aspects of giving but then giving back the time is more uh, is more precious isn't it you're giving back your time to the church by saying I'm willing to serve in a certain area so with a certain team uh, and whatnot. So that is expressing your commitment to the local church, uh, and you know, not saying, okay, one Sunday I'm going to be here, the other Sunday I'm going to be in this church, the third Sunday I'm going to be in another church, fourth Sunday I'm going to be there. That does not express your commitment, isn't it? Um, so being committed to the local church is uh, crucial. And some of the ways that you can express is, uh, you know, choose to attend uh, Sunday services. You know all the Sunday services. This is again coming to the context of worship ministry, is that you encourage your worship team members, is that they don't just show up to church on a Sunday that they are rostered to play. They show up to the church uh, regardless of them being rostered or not rostered. They choose to come to the church, and that is an expression of commitment, um, isn't it? Um, connecting with the rest of the church family, like cell groups or life groups, uh, personal meetings. Um, events, uh, conferences, etc. Being involved in the ministries at APC, uh, you know, uh, volunteering, etc. Uh, right, and it's coming down to page fifty-three. Um, is is personal accountability? We we again emphasize this. We encourage our worship team members to uh, have a mentor of their own. Um, because for their own spiritual growth um, as well, right? So uh, some of the practical ways in which personal accountability can be expressed is once again ensure that they spend personal time with God, in reading uh, His Word in prayer, uh, in personal fellowship. Uh, they do not, they make sure that they are not walking in sin. You build that personal rapport with them, so that they are vulnerable enough to express what they are feeling, what they are going through. Because at the end of the day, worship team members are still human beings, and we should not forget that. It's very important for us to keep a tab or uh, check on how they are doing, what they are doing, what you know, the spiritual life, and what's happening in their uh, take. Make an effort to know what's happening in their personal life, the challenges that they are facing. Is there anything you can do? And so that's building a culture of accountability. Right? It's all about the culture. And then you check with them saying, hey, um, do you want to take a break because of what you're going through? Why don't you take a break and then you know just come back after this? If there's something that you're struggling with, you provide help. You, you, you give them the pathway saying, OK, go to counseling, seek help, and then take a break, and then come and join us back once you're feeling a little better. Um, right? So. I mean, that's just to summarize uh, all the points that's mentioned there under personal accountability. So uh, being committed to the local church, uh, personal accountability, uh, and uh, and our personal life and testimony is just the beginning of uh, us understanding the importance of the spiritual aspects of worship ministry. OK, um, so what we'll do, we, we'll pause here. we we'll go for our break, and, and we'll come back in 10 minutes. All right, let's take care. I'll see you all in 10.